There were giants in the earth in those days, and when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. The Maya and Incas of South America believed a race of giants existed on Earth before the Great Flood. So did many other ancient civilizations. Some took them for gods, others left likenesses of them in stone or wrote about them in their histories. The Greeks and Romans told of blood falling from heaven and landing in the lap of the Earth goddess Gaia, who gave birth to the Titans a race of fearsome giants. Perhaps the most famous of all was Goliath the Philistine, one of five giant brothers. Vendel Jones is an archaeologist with a style of his own. He spent a lifetime tracking down Goliath and the Ark of the Covenant with which the Jewish holy book of the Midrash tells us the giant made off. Goliath thrashed his way through the Israeli uh, soldiers, ran over and scooped the ark up on his shoulder, slew Pinchas and Hophe, and took the ark back to the camp of the Philistines. It was in this field, 15 miles southwest of present-day Jerusalem, that legend says Goliath was finally slain, not by a giant warrior like himself, but by a puny boy, David, who, as this 9th century B.C. tablet indicates, would later become king of the Israelites. David reached into his script. He pulled out this black thing with long leather straps, and he put it on his arm and wrapped it like this, and said, you have come against me with a buckler and the armor and a shield and a sword, but I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Then he reached in and pulled out another set of leather straps, but this one had a stone in it. And like this, the shepherd boy cracked Goliath, stunned him, he didn't kill him. Goliath fell on his hands and knees. David ran over and took the sword of Goliath, this enormous sword that had killed Hophri and uh, Pinchas. And with Goliath's sword, he decapitated him. Just two miles from where the famous fight took place stands an 80-foot overgrown mound. This is believed to be Goliath's final resting place though no one knows for sure because it's never been excavated. In the American Midwest, there are also many large mounds, which are said to be graves. An author who has sold over 15 million books and written extensively on giants is Brad Steiger. Mass graves of giants were opened. Some of them, some of the men eight feet tall, some of the women seven feet tall, uh, some records of men 10 feet tall, and extremely large skulls. And extraordinarily, uh, some of these skulls had horns, some had extra rows of teeth, uh, some had other what we would call anomalies, but they were extraordinarily large skulls and uh, extraordinarily large people. A maverick archaeologist who has long been fascinated by legends of American giants is David Hatcher Childress. A number of mounds in the Midwest in America were excavated uh, starting in around 1850. And in many cases, they would find skeletons of people who were in excess of seven feet tall. And in many cases, they had double rows of teeth 
as well as, in some cases, six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. The one that was found in uh, Bridal Veil Falls, California by a group of miners, first they found this wall with very intricate hieroglyphics. They assumed that they were finding gold behind the wall. They broke it down and they found this woman holding a child covered with fur and a strange kind of dust. The same tall female mummified remains have been found in Texas. They have been found in Death Valley. They have been found in other parts of California. These old photographs and newspaper clippings are all that survive of these mysterious giants. Winner of the Newsmaker of the Year Award, journalist Jim Mars has a special interest in speculative science. Archaeology at that time was in a heyday. There was everybody that had a shovel was out trying to find something. But what's interesting is, is that the finding of these giant mummified bodies and giant fossils and bones, uh, really you can't pin to any particular location. They were finding them in Greece, they were finding them in Italy, they were finding them in the Middle East, they were finding them in America. And even if you write off a few of those as perhaps a hoax or a misinterpretation of something else, uh, you're still left with a tremendous amount of evidence to show that there were these giant beings at some point uh, walking the earth. In 1912, ranchers started coming to this isolated cave near Lovelock, Nevada to dig out bat guano for fertilizer. Inside, a surprise was waiting for them. They began excavating the 10 to 15 feet of guano that was here in this cave. They started discovering some unusual artifacts. They found duck decoys and baskets other things for hunting and fishing in the nearby lake that's now drying up. But then they made some very unusual discoveries, and those were of red-haired giants that were mummified. These giants were six and a half to seven feet tall. In many cases, they were mummified, wrapped up like Egyptian mummies, and they had long red hair going down to their shoulders. The ranchers couldn't explain it. It was the strangest thing they'd ever seen. But the Paiute Indians who lived around here knew all about it. In fact, back in 1883, Sarah Winnemucca, a Paiute Indian princess, had written a book called Life Among the Paiutes. In that book, she talked all about the giant red-haired people who used to live around this lake and live in this cave. She claimed they were cannibals. That tribe would eat the dead. They would make war on my people. My people went to work and gathered wood to fill up the mouth of the cave. At last, my people set it on fire and called out to them, give up or you will die. But no answer came. Now, one of the great mysteries of the West is what happened to these giants? There was nearly 60 skeletons brought out of this cave, but today they're nowhere to be found. Is it that there is some kind of archeological cover-up that has occurred here? Something that concerns giants? Perhaps the entire story may be a rural legend, or like tons of buffalo bones, the remains may have been burned and used with the bat guano as fertilizer. Whatever the explanation, proof that there were giants here has disappeared. Yet at the same time, tantalizing clues to their existence can be found all over the world. In South America, there are giant figures carved into rock so huge that at ground level, it's hard to tell what they depict though from the sky, that becomes dramatically clear. This one in Chile, known as Cerro Unitas, at over 300 feet high, is believed to be the largest representation of a human-like figure in the world. 
Who carved it and why remains a mystery. Half a world away in the United Kingdom, other giant figures stare up into the sky. This one is known as Cern Abbas near Shaftesbury. Cut into the chalky hillside, no one knows how long ago, it may represent the mythical hero Hercules. 160 miles away, the long man of Wilmington, 280 feet from head to toe. It emerges from the English hillside like a giant god from another era. Britain is crowded with such sites associated with giants. An authority on English folklore and the giants of Britain is Jennifer Westwood. In the beginning, in Britain, it was inhabited only by giants. And in those days, it was called Albion. And after the fall of Troy, a hero called Brutus came here with all his men and decided to conquer Albion. And so they battled for a bit with all these very savage giants. And they slew most of them. But there was one called Gog Magog that they kept alive, 12 foot high. And he had a wrestling match with the Duke of Cornwall called Coroneus. And first one got the upper hand, and then the other got the upper, ha upper hand. And then Gog Magog broke some of Coroneus' ribs. And he got so enraged that he just picked up this 12 foot giant. And he ran to the coast and he threw him over the cliff and the giant was smashed on the stones below and his blood stained the rocks red. Giants also figure in the mythology of Stonehenge, arguably the most famous megalithic structure in the world. These massive standing stones, the largest 30 feet tall and weighing 50 tons, were erected here thousands of years ago. The early Britons called the stone circle the Giant's Dance and believed giants had built it. Who really built Stonehenge and how they did it are enduring mysteries. Perhaps in the end, we have to turn to legends for an answer. This was somebody in the past with a technology that we don't have or a magical skill we don't have creating these things. The spiral-shaped Gilgal Rephaim is situated in the Golan Heights 50 miles from Damascus. Constructed from an estimated 40,000 tons of loose rocks, it is remarkably reminiscent of Stonehenge. Both have been dated at around 5,000 years old and have similar megalithic stones. And like Stonehenge, Gilgal is also said to be associated with giants. Only in this case, there's biblical text which seems to support the claim. Israeli archaeologist Daniel Herman is investigating the newly opened grave. This is a tomb of someone obviously a very powerful man. Look at the size of the stone slabs used. This must have taken an enormous amount of time and effort to construct. When the Israelites came here and wrote their Bible, it was already here, they saw it. So they have documented the identification of the site by saying that this region was ruled by Og, king of the Bashan. Og is described in the Book of Deuteronomy as, and I quote, for only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the Rephaim. Rephaim is Hebrew word for giants.
The surface of our planet is strewn with gigantic constructions dating back thousands of years. They're in the deserts, on the plains, under the oceans, high on the mountains, like those in South America. I think the world looked like the cities we see in uh, Machu Picchu, Tiahuanaco, Sashe Human. I think it was a world peopled by giants who structured their buildings out of massive building blocks, 500 ton, 250 ton blocks. Massive ruins, the scale of which stagger the imagination, are found throughout Central and South America. Even a skeptic might be tempted to ask, who could have built these architectural wonders, if not a race of giants? People of the Mediterranean island of Malta have an ancient belief that their island was known as the last stronghold of the giants of Europe. An explorer who has made a lifelong study of megalithic structures is the best-selling author of The Eyes of the Sphinx, Eric von Daniken. Malta has gigantic temples. They date really back to the past. Nobody knows exactly, but 5,000 years at least BC. And one of the temples in Gozo, still today, has the name the Temple of Giant, Gigantia, they call it there. A local legend says the temple was built by the giantess Sansuna. The blocks are so huge, so heavy, that no normal human being could have moved it. In Bolivia, only 30 kilometers from Lake Titicaca, there are gigantic stone platforms all over the place. The largest of it was once 29 meters long. Its weight has been calculated with 900 tons. Now, this is on a place where we are 4,100 meter high in the Andes, which means there are no trees, no wood, nothing. It is not possible to transport a 900 ton platform without any wooden rollers, even with wooden rollers. It would be extremely complicated. So these facts are here. You can see them, touch them, photograph them, but there is no explanation for it. For sure, the pre-Inca Indians the Aymara were not able to move it. So what is it? What's the result? We don't know. On many places on Earth, we find structures which could be related or to ETs, to a technology which we do not understand, or to giants. ETs, giants, a secret technology? Believers take it in their stride. Here's the best-selling author of Architects of the Underworld, Bruce Rux. The architects are that race or those races who built all the megaliths in uh, the old world, the pyramids, Stonehenge. Uh, they are the people who walked before us, the ones who inhabited this world before we did. Uh, we have called them gods. We have sometimes called them giants. Uh, they left their handiwork behind, and we have not been able to duplicate it. We've only reached the point now where we can really appreciate it. In Lebanon, 44 miles from Beirut, are the imposing ruins of Baalbek. There is mention of this place in the Old Testament's Book of Kings. Baalbek in particular is a very good example. That has the trilophon. Those are the largest stones in the world ever used for construction. They're so large we don't even know their actual weight. Uh, those stones were somehow quarried, moved five miles, lifted 25, 30 feet in the air, and placed together so closely that you can't fit a razor blade or a piece of paper in between them. We have no idea how they did it. We don't have a crane in the world that can lift weights anywhere near what those things are. No one knows for sure, but according to Arab tradition, the earliest temples were built here after the Great Flood by a tribe of giants for the biblical king Nimrod. But what exactly do we mean by the word giant? Bloodthirsty monsters like the one-eyed cyclops of Homer's Odyssey? Or the fee fi fo fum ogres of children's fairy tales? 
Or could it also include peaceable giants, living as you and I do, walking the streets of our cities in the full light of day? There are really two kinds of people who could be considered giants. There are giants who are genetically programmed to be tall, people who are normal, but their genes mean that uh, their genes lead them to be very, very tall. And then there are people who suffer from some kind of a disorder, uh, the most common of which, or at least the most well-known of which, is acromegaly, which is a disease in which there is too much growth hormone produced. And acromegaly has a lot of effects on the body. It, can, it not only leads to excessively tall people, but it also leads to potential problems with the uh, skeleton and potential problems with some of the organs inside. healthy, well-proportioned, seven-foot-tall, normal young man. I just wish I were as tall as he was. But what makes a person unusually tall? Is it a family trait, nutrition, or something else? Are tall people just ordinary people of exceptional height? Certainly, some tall people are giants in their profession, and if that happens to be basketball, they may be millionaires, too. Genuine giants didn't always do so well. Here's Jack the Giant Killer presenting his latest capture to the king. Towards the end of the 19th century, this nine-footer was given to the Russian Tsar as a gift. For some of the vertically unchallenged, it was possible to make a modest living by displaying themselves in public. From there, it wasn't very far to the carnival freak show which wasn't complete without one or more giants. Even after death, they could still draw a crowd. Anna Swan and her husband Martin, both seven and a half feet tall, went on tour as the world's tallest married couple. It probably took two storks to deliver their 24 pound newborn. Which brings us back to the question, where do they come from? Is it possible that in the dim and distant past they can trace their ancestry to a race of giants? The Weizmann Institute's award-winning scientist, Dr. Marvin Antelman, believes he has the answer. If we all have genetic material from the first man, then it is not surprising to find here and there that you would have a giant existing among us today because there would be a recessive gene that would produce such a person. The Watusi tribe, for instance, are very large. Uh, the median height for most of their males is close to about seven feet. They're extremely tall. There are biblical references to even taller people who lived in ancient times. Rabbi Itzhak Mamostin of the Center of Jewish Studies in Vancouver, Canada. It seems quite clear because of the references in Genesis and later on the book of Numbers and also in, in Deuteronomy, which are all fairly consistent with each other, that there were gigantic beings that seemed to stem from pre-flood era. Is it possible that environmental conditions of past ages favored the development of giants? Certainly we know from fossil evidence that some species, like dinosaurs, grew many times larger than they do today. A supporter of this thought-provoking and controversial theory is Dr. Carl Bohr. Optimal genetic expression means the best that the organism has within the DNA is expressed because of favorable atmospheric conditions. Based on fossil evidence, trees like the California giant sequoia grew much larger than they do today. One theory explains this by proposing that environmental conditions in the distant past were more conducive to gigantic growth. under these described conditions. Plants and animals 
would live longer, be much larger, and that's precisely what we find in the geologic column in the fossil record. Plants were much larger, all living systems were larger. We have animals that today have an eight or nine foot stature with a 16 to 20 foot stature. We have insects such as the dragonfly. Today, the dragonfly has perhaps a four inch wingspan. In the fossil record, his counterpart, Meganeuropsis, had up to a five foot wingspan. Everything was larger in the past. I'm of the opinion that under better atmospheric conditions, people were living uh, not only longer, but they were taller, much taller. Giants and dinosaurs could not exist today as they did in the past because the atmospheric conditions simply will not permit it. We had a greater ozone layer at the time prior to the flood. At the time of the flood, it was diminished to about one-seventh of what it was at that time, and therefore, life on this earth as we know it no longer has the same life expectancy as it did at the time of the flood. A thinning of the ozone layer means less protection from the ionizing radiation from space and less protection for plants and animals. Being interested in Earth's original conditions, after 35 years of research on those parameters, I've attempted to reconstruct that context. And in so doing, I've had our engineers build a biosphere that doubles the atmospheric pressure, that increases the electromagnetic energy, that increases the ratio of oxygen, but not to the level of toxicity, that eliminates ultraviolet radiation, etc. And the experiments that we've run have been very gratifying. In our control scientific experiment, we have measured the effects of a pulsed electromagnetic field on biological systems. We have these Pacu piranha fish that normally at three and a half years of age are about this size under optimal conditions. Yet we have them now in excess of 20 inches, weighing just under five pounds each under these control conditions. We have succeeded in producing giantism at an accelerated rate. Taken at face value, the research looks persuasive, though it has not yet been replicated by other scientists. The conclusion in the tradition seems to be fairly clear that, that gigantic beings were existing at one time and that as human history developed or physi physiological, uh, emotional, spiritual changes took place, the, those beings who survived seemed to be of a smaller gene pool. But the possibility that there were other strands of humanity, as it were, seems to be uh, almost explicitly stated in, in the Bible itself. In the Book of Numbers, we are told that after wandering in the desert with his people, Moses sent out scouts to find a place where they could settle. The scouts went north to Hebron. On their return, they reported, all the people we saw there are men of gigantic size. We felt no bigger than grasshoppers. And that is how we looked to them. The tribes continued northeast to Mount Seir, known today as Petra in Jordan. But that too, as mentioned in the Bible, had been settled by giants. Wherever they looked, it seemed they found the remnants of giants. If we look at scripture, there were giants in the earth in those days. And if we take that literally, rather than symbolically, that there were simply men of great powers and extraordinary abilities, then we could say that the first men, the first humans, were giants. Or we could theorize that these giants came from somewhere else and used Earth as a colony. In itself, 
this notion is a startling idea. But a people more ancient than the Israelites believed the very same thing. They wrote that the giants were celestial beings who came not from Earth, but from another planet. This is the battleground of the Gulf War. We know it as Iraq. In the distant past, several great civilizations sprang up here. One of them, Babylon, was legendary for its wealth and splendor. But long before Babylon, as long as 6,000 years ago, another remarkable civilization evolved. Its people were the Sumerians, who had an extraordinarily advanced culture. Their list of first uh, just almost sounds like a, uh, a whole list of, of our whole society. They had the first bicameral congress, they had the first writing, they had the first school systems, and you know, you just go on and on and on. Um, so you have to ask, uh, well, where did all this come from? And I think that you need to turn to the ancient Sumerians themselves and listen very carefully to what they have to say because what they have to say, not just in one place, but over and over and over again, is that they were taught civilization by these uh, beings that came from the heavens to the earth. Uh, they call them the Anunnaki. The Sumerians wrote down their history on clay tablets like these, which lay ignored in a Berlin museum for half a century. Few people have been able to decipher this ancient language, but one of them is Zechariah Sitchin. The writings and the pictorial uh, evidence left behind by the Sumerians going back 6,000 years speak and depict uh, people who came from another planet uh, called Nibiru, and uh, many of the depictions show them uh, much bigger, at least uh, by a third, perhaps more than the average uh, human being, so uh, they were giants. This Sumerian cylinder seal from a Berlin museum is astonishing for several reasons. First, it depicts our solar system with the sun at the center and the planets arrayed around it a fact not known to European science till around 300 years ago. It also shows the planet Pluto, which we didn't discover till 1930. And amazingly, there's another planet, which the Sumerians called Nibiru, and believed that it was from where the Anunnaki, or celestial giants, came from. If you look at the three figures depicted here, they all look more or less the same size. But if you bear in mind that this figure of the deity, that he is seated, and you add from the knee to the hip to his size, you will realize that he is about 10 feet tall, a giant, one of those who from heaven to earth came. Looking for signs of extraterrestrial life, astronomers have searched deeper and deeper into the universe. But all along, maybe they should have been looking closer to home. For it's in our own solar system that a mysterious object has recently been detected, near where the Sumerians placed their planet Nibiru, home of the Anunnaki. For the believers, this is convincing evidence that the celestial giants are real. The ancient Sumerian text, uh, just in a very broad overview, basically tell us that more than 400,000 years ago that these Anunnaki came from space 
and landed on the earth in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. They uh, began to set up a colony that they called Eden. According to Genesis, Eden, or Eden, is where Adam was created from dust and Eve from one of his ribs. Others, however, have a more high-tech version of how human life began. In time, needing manpower, needing workers, uh, jumped the gun on evolution uh, using genetic engineering. They took the uh, sperm of, uh, of one of the Anunnaki, mixed that with the ovum of a primitive humanoid, uh, probably uh, one of these uh, primitives that we are now finding uh, archaeological remains of in Africa, the, the famous Lucy. Um, and they produced a, a hybrid which uh, eventually became Cro-Magnon or, or modern man. Legend has it that when the Anunnaki came back after several thousand years to see how their genetic handiwork had turned out, they found the Earth females irresistibly attractive. It starts in the Bible. There you can read, in the beginning at Moses, when the sons of the gods saw that the daughter of men were beauty, they took them to wife. Later, out of the body's womb, giants came. So destructive were these titans that the Anunnaki who fathered them decided to destroy them. The apocryphal book of Baruch even tells us how many giants were wiped out. The book of Baruch says, then the Lord created the great flood, destroyed all life, which then was on Earth, including the four 090,000 giants. As the story goes, some of the Titans survived, but their reign as rulers of the Earth was over and humans became the dominant species. Still, the giants live on in memory, like something deep-rooted that comes from the beginnings of our existence. For some, this is far more than a simple memory. Perhaps they are the ones who report more and more encounters with giants emerging from UFOs. These believers will assure you that the Anunnaki or celestial giants are coming back. The town of Yatsitz is 25 miles west of Jerusalem. On January the 3rd, 1996, Chief of Security Herzl Constantini was at home when he heard a strange noise outside. When I opened the door, I was paralyzed with fear. I saw a gigantic being around five feet wide and 11 feet high. I estimate its weight at about two tons. I called the police, and two officers came over to the house. They laughed at us and accused me of drinking. But when the trackers came and saw the prints, they stopped laughing. The tracks led right across my field. Many of them were 14 inches deep. Over the past 10 years, reported sightings of UFOs with giant occupants have been on the increase. Former director of the British UFO Research Association, Jenny Randalls, is familiar with these statistics. 
From an analysis of 15,000 encounters with beings, giant encounters have increased every single year since the 1965 period onwards, and we are therefore getting far more reports of giants being seen today than we did 30 or 40 years ago. The apocryphal books of Enoch are believed by many to be over 5,000 years old. In them, Enoch writes about how he was taken up to the heavens by two men of great height. In this celestial journey, he also talks of meeting those who from heaven to earth came. Two huge men appeared to me, the like of which I had never seen on earth. Their faces were shining like the sun. Their eyes, too, were like a burning light. Then they took me up and carried me to the first heaven. And they fly with their wings and do the rounds of all the planets. They led before my face the elders, the rulers of the stellar orders. These groups carry out and carefully study the movements of the stars. Enoch is taken up to the sky at least three times. In our two days view, we would say he was taken up to a mother spaceship. There he has a discussion with what is called the highest, whatever the highest is. We would say maybe the commander of the spaceship. In other words, Enoch is what we would call a victim of alien abduction. This might seem like a far-fetched interpretation of a text written a very long time ago. On the other hand, present-day accounts by people who claim to be abductees are not so very different. The elders uh, were seven to nine, six to nine feet tall. They had white hair pale skin, almost albino, light blue eyes, wore white robes, and had no shoes on at all. And they could uh, speak audibly, and they could also speak through mental telepathy. I've checked the owner's manual that came with my brain, and uh, uh, nowhere, even in the small print, does it say that all dreaming will be a, between the hours of uh, 11 p.m. and 8 a.m., that generally speaking, it, it is. But what we know is the brain can generate extremely vivid images, extremely uh, real and lifelike things uh, that are hallucinations. But events in the Russian city of Voronezh can't be so easily explained. In this instance, there were at least 20 witnesses. Could they all have been dreaming the same dream in broad daylight? In September of 1989, Something happened in the city of Veronezh, 200 miles south of Moscow, which caught the attention of the world press. For several weeks, strange lights were seen over the city. Then on September the 27th, it was reported that a spacecraft landed in one of the city's public parks, from which three alien giant figures emerged. Nothing remotely like this had happened in Veronezh before. Before coming to America in 1990, Ukrainian journalist Paul Stonehill covered the Voronezh story for the international press. Top Voronezh researchers of anomalous phenomena who uh, include scientists, geologists, and uh, also some military people went to the site Im immediately thereafter. They were on the site on the 3rd of October studying and collecting specimen. The encounter became a media sensation on national television and in the international press. Drawings of the landings by children who were there capture the event vividly. It attracted the attention of the media around the world because it was effectively endorsed by TASS, the Soviet news agency, who up until that time had certainly not given any credence at all to this kind of story. 
they had the chance to talk to many eyewitnesses, adults as well as kids, uh, policemen, school teachers, s uh, students, scientists who had uh, witnessed similar or even differently shaped UFOs. The underlying theme was that giant-like beings exited from strange-looking craft, did some research throughout Voronezh, and were able to get back to their craft and fly away. For once we had a genuine large number of people all correlating with one another, describing the appearance of these giants. So it was not a case of you simply believe a witness or you don't. Here you couldn't fail to believe them because there were so many of them talking in concert. I was standing not far from the main road of the South Park, and I saw this flying object at an approximate height uh, 200 of 250 meters. It stayed at the same height and did not move horizontally. I was very interested by all that, because it could not be any kind of meteorological balloon. The creatures started coming out. They did not look too much like humans. They were much taller than humans. They did have shoulders, but they didn't see the head. He was huge, really huge, bigger than we are. He was a mighty figure. In 1989, Sergei Makarov was one of the school children who was in the Voronezh Park. I remember a crowd that gathered around the place. Everybody was scared, everybody turned pale. I was absolutely flabbergasted. Denis Bozhenko was also one of the boys in the park on that day in September 1989. <laughs> And you can find it in ancient mythology all over the world. We have the legends, and of course, in some cases, we have cave paintings of giant looking beings and even footsteps. I would think something was in the past, and this something was much bigger than our normal earthlings. Were they indeed our, our fathers? They, they were the patriarchs that, who came before us, that all the legends refer to, the giants, the Olympians who lived before us. Whether fact or fantasy, Giants have occupied our collective consciousness for as long as we can remember. But did a race of giants ever truly walk the earth? The ancient texts, as well as some of the evidence, suggest they did. And is it possible that recessive genes in the seven and eight footers that walk amongst us today could be connected to a former race of giants? Now, with reports like the giants of Aronej, one wonders if perhaps the godlike giants of the Sumerians are coming back. But whether they are real, imagined, or allegorical, one thing is for sure. The mystery and the myth of giants will be with us for a long time to come. <laughs>